Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Warren Hoag, IPI's Senior Advisor for External Relations, and I'm happy to welcome you to this latest event in the series we call Leading for Peace, Voices from the Field. The series is anchored in the premise that no one knows better what is happening in the far-flung and often fraught places where the UN operates than the people who live and work there. And we pride ourselves at IPI in offering a forum where people from the field can speak directly to people in a headquarters audience like this one. And that there is great interest in such an exchange is attested to by the size of this crowd today in what is virtually a holiday week here in the UN community. Uh, our voice from the field today is Nikolai Mladenov, who is the UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, known as UNSCO in UN speak. Uh, he is based in Jerusalem with offices in Ramallah and Gaza. You have his full biography in your papers, but briefly, prior to assuming his current post in February 2015, Mr. Mladenov served as Special Representative for Iraq and head of the UN Assistance Mission for Iraq, known as UNAMI. He is a former foreign minister and defense minister of Bulgaria and a former member of the Bulgarian and European parliaments. When we sent this invitation out on December 5th, the conversation we anticipated was one on the current humanitarian situation in Gaza and the prospects for returning the territory to the control of the legitimate Palestinian National Authority. On our minds then was the so-called Cairo Agreement, signed by Hamas and Fatah in mid-October, that called for a halt in the decade-long rift between the two parties and held out the promise of reconciliation in Gaza. A day later, though, President Trump led a hulking new elephant into the Mid Middle Eastern room when he announced that the United States, upending decades of American policy, would recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and begin plans to move the American embassy there from its present location in Tel Aviv. As you know, yesterday, 14 of the 15 countries on the Security Council, including Washington's closest allies, voted to demand, in effect, that Washington rescind that decision. But since the one vote against was a veto cast by the United States, the measure was defeated. While the Trump decision on Jerusalem and its possible consequences have become an irresistible focus of any conversation about the Palestinian territories, we do not want to lose sight of the original template for this conversation, which remains such an important development a possible reconciliation in Gaza. Mr. Mladenov managed to address both of these volatile situations in his public briefing to the Security Council yesterday, so I'm delighted that he is here at IPI today to take them up with us, plus anything else in the area of expertise and practice that may be on your minds during the question and answer period. So please join me in welcoming to IPI the Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, Nikolai Mladenov. Warren, thank you very much for those uh, kind words of introduction. Long before I ever thought I would uh, be dealing with the Middle East Peace Process, a very good friend of mine over gin tonic at the King David Hotel in Jerusalem told me never get involved in the Middle East Peace Process. You will get excited about small things, disappointed about big things, and when you look back, nothing would have changed. I start with this because I'm not sure whether what I will tell you today is part of my excitement about small things or about my disappointment with big things. Um, but certainly, we're at a critical crossroad of the Middle East peace process. Um, it is not just the American decision it is the situation in Gaza. It is the uh, stalled peace process for a number of years now. Um, it is the political dynamics, both in Israel and among the Palestinians. 
um, that are creating a very different situation today that we, uh, we've had, we haven't had for a very long time. Practically, the international um, architecture that has dealt with this conflict for a very long time is uh, collapsing. We look at the situation on the ground. Uh, we see that there's no uh, clear pathway towards uh, negotiations. Um, the basic parameters of the consensus on how you deal with resolving the conflict are being questioned. So there are a lot of question marks out there. And we really need to uh, reinvent it. Or I need to get a different job. <laughs> or I need to get the Secretary General to write something different on my business card. But a Middle East peace process, in the sense that it has existed for the last quarter of a century, next year it will be 25 years since Oslo, um, needs to be thought through very differently from now on. Notwithstanding these remarks, I'd like to really start with Gaza, because I think the situation today uh, continues to be uh, extremely tense in Gaza. Um, and literally, um, Gaza is a power, powder keg that can explode at any, any moment now. I want to start first with a quick overview of the humanitarian situation there and the difficulties that uh, uh, we face and what we're doing about them as the United Nations and then move on to the Cairo Agreement and, um, and the prospects for the future, because they're both um, interconnected. Um, we published a report uh, earlier this year, which is about the 10 years of Hamas's control of Gaza and what that control actually has entailed. And if one had to summarize it in a couple of words, for the last 10 years since Hamas effectively took control of Gaza, Gaza has de-developed. And it has de-developed across the board um, uh, in all fields. Um, this is the result of uh, uh, a number of uh, factors. And it certainly cannot be addressed by uh, incremental measures. It cannot be addressed by humanitarian measures only, just by Israel, just by the pa uh, Palestine or, 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 or only Egypt. It has to be addressed together in a very holistic approach. And that holistic approach must start with the return of the legitimate Palestinian Authority in control of Gaza. And this is why the Cairo Agreement um, is so important and the steps that, um, um, that have been taken since uh, October the 12th. If one looks at um, a couple of uh, some key indicators of the situation in Gaza, let me start with one um, which is very basic to all of us, water. Um, if in 2000, 98% of the water piped in Gaza's pipes was drinkable, today uh, it is less than 10%. 10% from effectively 100% over 10 years. 98%, 98% of Gaza's aquifer is already um, uh, polluted and it cannot be used for potable water. Effectively, this damage will not be reversible after 2020 and that's just a couple of years away from now. So we're facing a situation in which drinking water in Gaza is it's, it's disappearing. One can say, well, you can replace that with desalinated water. But for desalinated water, you need energy. And on average, normal, quote unquote, for Gaza for the last 10 years has been 12 hours of electricity per day. Now, uh, last week, we had a, a couple of days in which it was uh, uh, 24 hours without electricity for everyone. And that effectively means that desalination plants, water treatment facilities cannot function effectively to replace what is what has been lost. Unemployment in Gaza is 45% official figures. And among the youth, it goes up to 67% of youth in Gaza are unemployed. Certainly, if you compare that to the situation in the West Bank, it's very different. In the West Bank, unemployment is about uh, uh, 30, 20, 20, between 20 and 30, let's say 30 percent at the upper end of the estimate. Gaza's GDP for the last 10 years has declined by 10 percent, while the West Bank GDP has grown by over 50 percent. That creates a completely different environment in which people in Gaza and people in West, the West Bank function, notwithstanding every political security and other um, uh, concern that, that, that they have. 
some 40% of Gazans live in poverty. So unemployment, poverty, lack of water, lack of electricity for a decade, for a whole generation growing up. Um, and this situation has continued and is actually, unfortunately, uh, uh, being exacerbated over the last few months. And I'll get a little bit uh, later to that. Why has Gaza de-developed during this period? First and foremost, we have to start with the fact that it has been um, uh, taken away, it's been pushed away from the control of the legitimate Palestinian Authority, and it has been um, uh, under the control of Hamas. Now that, apart from the political consequences, has some very, very practical consequences. One, that means that Gaza doesn't have access to development financing. Secondly, institution building has stopped. Thirdly, for a decade, you have a completely different um, uh, body of laws that has developed in Gaza and the way it has been implemented from what, what you have um, in, in, in the West Bank. And although the PA has continued to fund the electricity bill and, 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 and the hospital fees, etc., for, for, for the people of Gaza, it has received very little back in terms of revenue uh, from the situation um, in Gaza, which is not under its control. So effectively, if the, uh, until now, the Palestinian Authority would pay the electricity bill for the whole of Gaza, it would pay it to Israel. Um, uh, from the revenues that were collected in Gaza, uh, uh, nothing was transferred back to, to Ramallah. And that led President Abbas and, and many in the Palestinian Authority to actually uh, quite openly speak, um, as of the last few months, that they have been subsidizing Gaza's, Hamas's control over the situation in Gaza. Secondly, is the impact of the Israeli closures. Um, and the impact of the, those closures has been devastating. Um, it is devastating in terms of um, um, access of people, access of goods, um, uh, services, everything. Uh, the number of people that are allowed in and out of Gaza is minuscule compared to its uh, uh, population of 2 million. The goods that go in or out of Gaza, mostly in, are subjected to um, uh, a dual-use list uh, to, in order to make sure that Israel's security concerns are met and, and, and things don't go into Hamas's military infrastructure of tunnels and rockets. But effectively, that list is so extensive that practically every, almost everything you can see um, is uh, subjected to such controls. Um, that makes uh, international projects also very difficult to, uh, to deliver. Uh, Rafa has been closed um, for most of the year. Um, in fact, I think uh, in 2017 it was open only for about 30 days. Um, and Rafa is the lifeline uh, uh, for Gaza because that provides access to people. Uh, to the rest of the world. There are massive waiting lists for hospital treatment, for people, students who can't get out, families that cannot be um, united. And thirdly, it is the three wars that the people of Gaza have had to endure. And the last one, of course, uh, being the most devastating one. And the last one, 170,000 buildings were damaged or destroyed. Um, a lot of them have now been reconstructed thanks to international assistance and a very complicated, very elaborate system that the United Nations, together with Israel and the Palestinian Authority, set up to, to make sure that, um, that the um, uh, materials don't go into the hands of the um, uh, militants um, on the ground. But this is for 10 years. This situation has continued for 10 years. And over the last few months, since the beginning of this year, it has rapidly uh, deteriorated and become even more complicated because of a number of uh, uh, measures that um, uh, the Palestinian Authority has put in place after Hamas declared the creation of this administrative committee, as they called it, which uh, the PA saw as an alternative shadow government um, aimed at splitting Gaza from the rest of Palestine. Um, a lot of measures have been put in place to pressure Hamas into giving up that control um, since uh, March of this year. And these uh, uh, measures uh, have indeed uh, uh, pressured uh, Hamas into coming into the fold of negotiations with, uh, with Fatah and with the Palestinian Authority. However, that has come at a massively expense, uh, uh, at great expense to the, to the population. Um, some 12,000 working uh, uh, 
people in the public sector were early retired, allowances were cut for public servants, uh, but most importantly, electricity supplies were reduced. Um, because the PA uh, sent a letter to Israel saying that they will cap the amount of money they pay per month for Gaza electricity, and that led to a further uh, reduction of about uh, 20 to 30 percent of electricity supplied to Gaza. So now, as of March, it is not the new normal it is not 12 hours of electricity per day; it is three to four hours of electricity per day. And with three to four hours of electricity per day. It means that now every single health facility in Gaza, every single hospital functions only because the United Nations is able to provide um, uh, fuel to its generators. And let me explain what that actually means. In a hospital that services 300,000 people, functioning on one generator of electricity, funded by fuel, with fuel funded by the United Nations. If this generator breaks down, the hospital management has seven minutes in which they must switch up the backup generator, because seven minutes is the amount of time that the life-supporting equipment can function on batteries. And once they switch on the backup generator, it's only the emergency services in the hospitals that continue to function. The rest of the hospital has no electricity. It means that if you hope to go for dialysis treatment, you can get you, you may have to go there at three o'clock or four o'clock at night because that's when electricity is available. It is a terribly complicated humanitarian situation which is hanging by a thread and that thread currently is what is provided by the United Nations. Uh, it means that water effectively now that is pumped through the pipes is not potable. Um, in Gaza, it means that this entire sanitation system has shut down because of lack of electricity. And that effectively means that 100,000, 100 million liters of untreated sewage on a daily basis since March is pumped into the Mediterranean. 100 million tons of untreated sewage every single day in the Mediterranean. The coastal waters are now polluted. This is affecting the Israeli city of Ashdod, where uh, water sewage, water treatment facilities have also had to, um, had to shut down. Obviously, the economy is affected by all of this. Um, so the situation um, is, is, uh, is critical. If it's not in this, in this current environment, if it's not for the fuel that the UN provides to hospitals, if it's not for what UNRWA does in terms of uh, providing uh, services, um, uh, health and, and education, and if it's not for the uh, humanitarian assistance that 1.4 million out of 2 million people received through the United Nations and Gaza, it would have exploded uh, a long time um, ago again. And this is what is hanging the situation um, on, on the ground. And against this backdrop, um, in October, we had um, uh, what was really a groundbreaking ag agreement uh, sponsored by Egypt between Fatah and Hamas to open the road towards bringing uh, the legitimate uh, Palestinian Authority back into Gaza. Um, why was this agreement groundbreaking? Because it took a very different approach to prior agreements. It may still fail, but it took a very different approach. And the approach was that you don't uh, go to the top issues in the beginning, you start with issues that are smaller and easier to deal with and you build trust until you get to the point at which you should be able to um, address the key issues uh, for reconciliation, which is effectively Hamas's military control of Gaza, control of the security situation on the ground, um, and revenue. And the steps, the first step in that agreement was the handing over of the crossings from Hamas to the legitimate Palestinian um, government. That step was implemented. Uh, the second step was to assess at what point um, um, the government has been enabled to return to Gaza, uh, take over control of the various ministries, um, and begin delivering services, collecting revenues, delivering services, paying salaries, um, and then move on to addressing the issue of security and um, uh, control of, um, um, of, of the military. Now, this agreement uh, functioned very well in the beginning, and now is reached a point at which uh, uh, it, it is a bit stuck. 
And this is what currently makes us very, very concerned. Because um, as of December, um, there are uh, you know, a lot of details of what, who said what and why. Uh, but effectively, the Palestinian Authority is saying that it has not been enabled to fully uh, uh, re regain control of ministries in Gaza, while Hamas says that it has done everything in its power to enable the Palestinian Authority to return. But the fact of the matter is that because there's no disagreement on this, salaries cannot be paid, revenues cannot be collected, um, and the parties cannot move on to the next stage of discussions, which includes um, security and, and, and military. So today, we have um, a, a situation in which, for the people that live in these deplorable conditions that I uh, explained in the beginning, um, hope had been created, and then that hope now has been put on hold, and they've become very angry. Um, there's a lot of tension on the ground, um, and that tension can um, explode um, uh, uh, very, very easily. One key issue, um, probably not just in the Middle East, but certainly in the Middle East, um, is one key um, approach, if you wish, is, or fear, is that if you create hope and you take hope away, violence follows. And this is where we are right now in Gaza. Hope had been created by this agreement. Hope seems to have been taken away now because the agreement is not uh, uh, being implemented. There's no humanitarian, re there's no relief to the measures that were put in place by the Palestinian um, um, Authority. And this can very easily lead to violence. And if on top of that, you include the emotional issue that uh, Jerusalem uh, uh, presents to the calculation, and the fact that a third of the rockets fired from Gaza, a third of the rockets fired from Gaza into Israel this year came since December 7th of this year. One third, there were about 30 odd rockets, I think, this, maybe a little bit over 30 this year, um, and, and about a third of them came um, uh, uh, since December uh, 7th, you can see how easily the situation can, um, can escalate. Nobody has an interest in that escalation on the ground. And I can assure you that our work um, uh, on a daily basis uh, with all sides, uh, Palestinians, Israeli, the region, Egypt, everyone, is to keep um, um, sending messages to everyone that escalation must at all costs be avoided right now. Um, and uh, uh, I don't know how long uh, this situation will be sustainable, but certainly um, I hope that very soon we will be able to get back onto the track of implementing the uh, Egyptian brokered agreement. Um, there is a way to, to, to get out of the deadlock, the, the current deadlock, that involves, one, postponing the, some of the deadlines of the agreement so that people understand that certain things that didn't happen by December will be happening later next year, and secondly, by uh, introducing some relief measures, by, on, particularly on electricity um, and other factors um, um, on the ground. And that can uh, provide some breathing space um, uh, for the future. But uh, the situation remains um, extremely, extremely tense. Um, the reason why I brought this up yesterday in the Security <coughs> Council uh, uh, briefing, and I'm happy that we didn't change the topic today, I'm sure there'll be questions on other issues, now is because I fear that we should not lose track of this. If we lose track of this, we will sleepwalk into another conflict, um, and the price of that will be uh, uh, very heavy uh, in, in terms of human costs, in terms of economic costs, and certainly in terms of uh, political costs. And I can assure you that we um, continue to work very intensely um, with uh, uh, the US, with uh, the Russians, the Europeans, and the Quartet, um, with the Egyptians and um, um, others in the region to, uh, to, to really uh, uh, contain also the humanitarian um, uh, fallout of, um, of the current situation. But I hope that soon, again, um, uh, we'll be able to return back to um, uh, the implementation of this agreement. Um, thank you very much, and I hope that wasn't a bit too long, and I'll be happy to take any questions. <clears throat> I'm going to have a little conversation with Nikolai here for a couple of minutes, and then we'll go to you for your questions. And before we move to Jerusalem, so the elephant in the room, I just want to ask you something, what you just said right now, which is um, 
the complete absence of trust. Uh, and, and the role of the you and the UN in the middle of that heavily fraught political situation at a time when a lot of United Nations reviews are focusing on, on the importance of United Nations work to understand the politics of the region. Are you able to build any trust for the United Nations with all those disparate people? Well, I, I hope I am. Um, we have a very uh, uh, open relationship and a very direct dialogue with, uh, with everyone, with uh, both the Israeli and the Palestinian um, um, side. Um, the UN is a very easy punching bag for people to use and to blame um, their own deficiencies on the United Nations. Um, it's not, a, you know, particularly in this conflict. This happens around the world. I've seen it elsewhere in Iraq, elsewhere in, in, in other parts of the world. Um, but certainly what I think is, is very important is something that um, uh, the Secretary General has been uh, very keen to send out as a message to everyone. And that is that um, we will take a very balanced and very clear-headed approach on how we deal with this conflict. And when one of the sides does something that is wrong, that we need to speak out against, we will speak out against. But when somebody does something that is good, we will support it and, and, and we will encourage it. So we need to be very um, uh, clear in this. Because I think from the perspective of the Secretariat, um, uh, the Secretary General, myself, and our, our teams um, on the ground, uh, taking that approach is critically important to be able to retain the, um, the communication and to retain the, um, the ability to work, to work with everyone, particularly at a time when it's so, um, so in fashion to make strong um, statements about I'm not going to do this or I'm not going to talk to that person. Uh, you need somebody who's been able, who is able to talk to uh, to all sides, uh, as as part of our, you know, preventive diplomacy, if you wish, in our preventive um, our, our actions to uh, uh, prevent conflict. Um, Nikolai, two days after President Trump made his announcement on December eighth, you said the following: the UN has repeatedly declared that any unilateral decision that seeks to alter the character and status of Jerusalem or that may alter these long-standing principles could seriously undermine current peace efforts and may have repercussions across the region, unquote. Uh, what are you thinking now? Um, we're now on the 19th of December, uh, 13 days after the president's announcement. Is that dire prediction coming true? Pretty much. Um, I think it's important to understand that Jerusalem is, you know, a final status issue that needs to be decided by the uh, by the two by the two parties in direct negotiations. Um, this is this has been said by everyone uh, consistently for many years. There is no Plan B, as the uh, Secretary General said. There is no Plan B to the to the two-state solution. Uh, but I think it's also important to recognize that why Jerusalem is such. Uh, an emotional issue for everyone, because if we if we avoid uh, uh, or or if we are unable to admit publicly that it is and it will always be the center of life for the Jewish people for thousands of years, just as it has been and it will always be the center of life for the Palestinians. It will always host the holy sites of three great religions. Um, if we don't take that into our understanding, um, uh, we will not be able to, to, to actually um, uh, be clear-headed, if you wish, in how the situation um, is resolved. But certainly, uh, from a perspective, from the UN perspective, this remains an issue that needs to be decided by the final status, in final status negotiations by the two sides. Um, I have not been convinced, um, I'm happy to be convinced by somebody, but I have not been convinced until now that any other outcome um, except a two-state solution in which Israelis and Palestinians live separate and live in two states and then you know, addressing all the economic and social, security, social issues and security issues um, uh, on their own and, and jointly, but in two different states, addresses the fundamental desires of both 
the Jewish people and, 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 and the Palestinian people. And that's why Jerusalem is such, a, such a, 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 an explosive uh, uh, emotional uh, issue for everyone. We just return one second to Gaza, then we'll go to questions. Uh, picking up on your comment about the, the process and how it was going reasonably well and then suddenly stalled, I take it from the things you were saying about restoration of services and opening of crossings, there is sort of a roadmap of steps to be taken once uh, the new authority is established that the Palestinian National Authority has come back. Um, are those steps clear in your head? In other words, if you have to go ahead from the two sides, is there a way that one can move forward and maybe restore the feeling that it was actually uh, making some progress? Yes, the steps are quite clear, um, and both sides understand what they include. Um, um, the question is the political will. Um, the political will to actually take a calculated risk and extend your hand in trust that the other side will also deliver. Um, and, and, and this is very, very problematic. And there are all kinds of other problems. For example, on um, uh, payment of salaries. The PA is obviously very reluctant to pay salaries to people who have been recruited by Hamas um, in Gaza. And clearly, there are very good reasons why they're reluctant to do that. Um, they're very reluctant to pay stipends, if you wish, because um, uh, do you recognize these people that have been um, uh, recruited by Hamas to become suddenly employees of the PA? Uh, what does that actually mean in terms of security and, 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 and all kinds of other issues? Um, certainly, there are very specific problems that need to be addressed in that in return of um, uh, return of um, uh, the ability to collect revenues, for example, in Gaza. Um, uh, a few, uh, a couple of weeks ago, the PA instructed its former employees go back into the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Religious Affairs, and the Ministry of Local Affairs in Gaza, and they were blocked by the people who sit there who were employed by Hamas. So there are all kinds of these roadblocks that need to be overcome. None of them um, are obstacles that cannot be resolved if you have the political will and if you understand that this process will take time. If you try and do everything in one day, clearly it's not going to happen. But if you understand that it will take time, and ultimately that will need to address also the security and military aspect of it, um, in Gaza, it, it's doable. And you mentioned also postponing deadlines is another Postponing strategy. certain deadlines, that's a, that's a part of the strategy to save the, uh, the agreement because the deadlines that were uh, agreed to are um, very, very tight and, and clearly impossible to meet. Excellent. I'd love to get some questions from the floor. If you'd raise your hand, I'm going to call on you. Um, I think we'll take three questions sure. at once and answer them all together and wait for the microphone to come to you and please identify yourself. And I'm going to ask you when I call on you to stand because the crowd is so large they won't see you otherwise. So I have John. Did you raise your hand, John? And then George, and then in the corner. So I'm, I'm with IPI. First of all, thank you very much. Um, I, I want you to say something more about your reference to the possibility of final status negotiations. So Roger Cohen in the New York Times had an article 10 days ago basically stating that there is no peace process. He sort of called out Trump on this. He said it really doesn't matter what Trump said on Jerusalem because there's no peace process. So from the point of view of the Secretary General, and, and we've just lived yesterday with the United States veto of the resolution proposed by others on Jerusalem, what, what, what are the aspects of the final status negotiation possibility that the Secretary General is advancing and what are those prospects? And do you agree with Roger Cohen? Thank you. My second was then. Oh, my second was George, exactly. Thank you. Uh, George Baumgarten, correspondent for Jewish newspapers in North America and other assorted media as far afield as East Africa and Kazakhstan. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to debate the uh, legality of Pre uh, President Trump's proclamation or the propriety of um, promulgating it at this particular uh, point in time. It occurs to me that this is all uh, 
that this is all an outgrowth of Resolution 181, which, as you know, was celebrated three weeks ago this morning in the very uh, hall in which it was uh, held and voted in uh, 1947. That provided for two states with specified borders, and it provided that Jerusalem was to be a corpus separatum, a separate body, a separate piece of territory. Uh, at the end of the, two years later, at the end of the independence war, you ended up with a new state of a set of borders, uh, which are now universally accepted as the basis for negotiation. But uh, the, uh, the borders within Jerusalem, the, uh, within Jerusalem are supposed to be sacrosanct and cannot be touched. Why is it that those borders are accepted, but Jerusalem uh, is untouchable. Thank you. Another question. <clears throat> Shirley Chesney, uh, Peace Action and the NGO Committee on Disarmament and Peace and Security. Just hold the microphone very close to your mouth, yeah. Shirley. Uh, granted that you presented a very, very grim picture of the humanitarian situation which you said was going on for about 10 years. What do you see as the possibility and who would be listening or capable of correcting the dire situation that you think we must attend to if we are to uh, not have a, a catastrophic situation? I didn't, I'd, I'd like you to elaborate on your analysis of why the humanitarian situation was allowed to deteriorate. Thanks. Take those three and we'll get three more. Thank you. Um, let me actually start with Shirley's question first, uh, very briefly. I think the main responsibility, I mean, we're holding the situation by a thread with the money that we have and with the framework that we have established in place for a number of years, but this is not sustainable. Um, it can prevent uh, catastrophes, but it cannot uh, really help people develop and be lifted out of poverty. Um, one idea which we're now discussing with, uh, 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 with Israel and with the Palestinian Authority, which we've been about it for a couple of months now, um, uh, is, is what can we do together to actually create jobs in Gaza within the limitations that exist, but to create jobs and help exports, because that will help people actually generate more income and generate more uh, opportunities for them to, uh, to develop and grow. Um, but certainly to address it in a sustainable manner, you need very clearly the Palestinian Authority back in control of Gaza. Civilian control and security control. Um, and as President Abbas very uh, uh, nicely puts it, uh, one law, uh, uh, one gun. So everything needs to be under the control of one single government. You can have elections, you can choose who's in the government, and that's it, but you can't have this situation in which, you know, a militant organization controls one territory and, you know, a government controls another territory. Um, secondly, you need to uh, uh, relax and ultimately lift the movement and access restrictions um, that have been put in place. Um, and they range from everything. The fishing zone, uh, which is uh, you know the, the 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 zone in which Gaza fishermen are allowed to go into the sea, who the the dual use list, the limitations on movements of people, um, all of this is 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 is, uh, is critical. And then thirdly, I think what we in the international community need to do is, if one and two are in place effectively really focus on institution building, because the institution building agenda, the developmental agenda in Gaza has been put on hold because of the humanitarian um, situation for a decade now. Um, and <laughs> honestly, even if you know, people tell you we're doing a developmental project in Gaza, effectively it is actually humanitarian, uh, uh, saving the day rather than actually investing in the, in the, in the future. Um, in terms of uh, uh, George's question on um, Jerusalem, um, yeah. the basis is that Jerusalem 
And this has been agreed and, 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 uh, and has been stated and passed UN Security Council and other resolutions, international law um, should be the capital of two states. So if you take the, uh, if you take the goal of a two-state solution, um, uh, both of these two states should find their capitals in the, in, in the city of Jerusalem. Um, and that is the basis that has been uh, uh, the core of agreement for um, at least for the last quarter of a century. Um, and that is why, you know, the status of Jerusalem is defined as one of the final status issues, along with borders and with uh, uh, settlements and with uh, 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 refugees, etc. Um, but it, that decision is up to the, to the two sides. Um, and it is doable. Uh, and it is possible um, in a manner that addresses and upholds the religious and uh, uh, national traditions of, uh, of, of everyone um, uh, on the ground. Um, going to John's question on the um, final status negotiations. Um, look, in all honesty, we're, we're very far from any negotiation right now, let alone a final status negotiation. Um, and um, there are objective reasons for that. Objective reasons within Israel's own political process in terms of, you know, coalition politics and the, where, where public uh, opinion is. Objective reasons on the Palestinian side um, as well. Um, if you go back to the summer of last year, the Quartet published what I still believe is probably one of the best documents ever written on this issue. What are the obstacles to the two-state solution? The Quartet report. And it came out with some 10 recommendations which, despite everything that has been said since then, are still very much valid. And recommendation, I don't remember if it was recommendation number one, but one of the top recommendations is that you need a series of um, um, uh, steps on the ground to be taken to rebuild trust between the two sides. And a lot of those steps are on um, economic development and other issues that actually lift the Palestinian um, economy and society up and create more space for negotiations to take place. One issue that um, uh, over the last year, uh, collectively, we've been successful, and credit here must go to the uh, US team, uh, Jason Greenblatt and, um, uh, and, and this administration, is pushing through key agreements on water, on electricity, between the Israelis and the Palestinians um, uh, that have been stalled for years and years and years. Um, that type of effort, if it were to continue, I don't know what will happen with that, you know, that type of an engagement currently, but that type of an effort that we've all been very much um, focused on is uh, uh, part of preparing the ground, if you wish, for um, uh, a meaningful resolution, meaningful negotiation uh, between uh, both sides. Uh, with the goal, as the Secretary General always says, there's no plan B of a two-state solution. I want to interrupt just a second. You mentioned the quartet in passing. I know you are the representative to the quartet. We don't hear as much publicly about the quartet as we used to, the quartet being the Russian Federation, the US, the EU, and the UN. Um, can you bring us up to date? It was created in 2002. Um, uh, are we not hearing about them because nobody's reporting it? Are they actually doing lots of good things? Uh, just bring me up to date with where the quartet stands and how useful it is right now. It's, it has its ups and downs. <laughs> uh, when um, I took this uh, this job, I inherited a paper from my predecessor, which had, which said, you know, the quartet's finished. There's no more point. Um, um, I don't believe that that's true, and I still don't believe that that's true because I think that fundamentally, if you are able to keep the Americans, the Russians, and the Europeans and the UN in the same room, on the same table, to deal with one issue, that is an asset. And that is a great asset in a world in which these opportunities are uh, disappearing. We spent a lot of efforts with the previous US administration to restore the um, uh, activities of the quartet, the report. Uh, we went together to talk to the Egyptians, to the Saudis, to the uh, Jordanians, we uh, engaged with the Palestinians and the Israelis, all four of us, uh, a little bit uh, uh, you know, less publicly than uh, maybe in the past. Um, uh, uh, and with this new administration, the communication continues between the four um, envoys. Uh, we're less now maybe about making statements 
but more about trying to coordinate our uh, uh, work. So it's a different um, environment. But I hope that we are able to retain this format because this format, not just for the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict, but if you even look more broadly for the rest of the region, um, is critical to be uh, to be to be sustained. I'll take some more questions over here on the left, right there, this gentleman, and do I see a third hand? Okay, we'll take these two right now. Uh, hi, uh, Jeff Laurenti. Over those 10 years uh, since the, the Palestinian um, uh, parties, in effect, broke apart, you've also had external changes in the Arab world that have dramatically reshaped the, the level of interest and commitment. So I wonder if you might explore with us for a moment uh, what the diversion of attention to the Arab uprisings and those that have continued to play out have done in terms of Palestinian hopes for having solidarity and backing from a wider Arab world. One thinks in particular of the Saudis now seeming to be putting out hints, take whatever crumbs you can get, uh, that uh, we're not in this game very much longer. Is that a misimpression in the press? Uh, and as the Arab world finds many other uh, points of interest to pursue, where have the Europeans been in either trying to prop up the process or have they lost their interest as well? Hi there. Yeah, thanks, James Reinald. It kind of follows or even mirrors over the previous question, but I was going to ask you to comment on the uh, outside-in approach, the idea that Saudi Arabia under MBS and Israel have got such a shared concern over the uh, Iranian threat in the region, that they're willing to cooperate on that front and in doing so need to resolve the Palestinian question once and for all, presumably pushing them towards what can only be a bad deal for them and a good deal for Israel? We'll, we'll take a third question here. Good, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Maher Nasser. Nikolai, I'm actually going back to Gaza. I started working with UNRWA in Gaza 30 years ago. And the reason I went to Gaza was a, a report written by Sarah Roy in 1986 for the West Bank Database Project, in which she used words that you started with. Gaza, she described it as a powder keg about to explode. That was 1987, <laughs> when I read it early 1987. I went to work in Gaza in August 1987, and the first intifada happened in December. 150 to 200,000 people worked from Gaza in Israel in those days. They had 24-hour electricity, water was drinkable, and there was free movement to Gaza, to the West Bank, and to Israel. And yet, that intifada happened. Today, you described Gaza has 2 million people, three times as many people. Water is not drinkable. Unemployment is 40%, 50%. Why hasn't it exploded so far? Mm -hmm. I'll take those three questions. Thank you. That's a very good question. Um, external changes in the... Um, um, Arab world, uh, clearly um, um, attention has been diverted from this conflict in the Arab world because of all the other conflicts. Um, uh, and, and honestly, when I, when I arrived in Jerusalem from Baghdad, and I had my first security briefing um, by my own team, and they came in very worried into my office, and they said, you know, today's been a very bad day. Uh, one person was injured, um, you know, uh, three people uh, uh, were hurt. Uh, it's, it's a very bad day. And I looked at them and I said, look, guys, I come from Baghdad. <laughs> you know, our level of uh, tolerance of violence there was diff very different from this. But, you know, compared to the rest of the conflicts in the region, the violence of this conflict currently is at, I don't know if it's an all-time low, but pretty, pretty low. This year compared to last year, compared to the previous year, um, it, is, it is on the decline. And I think we need to understand that and we can understand why the attention has shifted elsewhere because of not just the, the large-scale violence that has happened in 
Syria and Iraq and Libya and Yemen and elsewhere, uh, the radicalization of uh, uh, populations, the collapsing of states. Uh, but you still see that it may be one or two people in the Israeli-Palestinian um, environment that get hurt in Jerusalem, and that violence can spread across the region very, very easily. In, in, in Iraq, when the uh, Holy Shrine in Samara was blown up, I think there were about 100 mosques that were bombed within the next couple of days, and you know, over three, 400 people were killed. But that level of violence, you know, did not spread out across the Middle East. You have what you have when you when when you in 2015, uh, uh, when we had problems in Jerusalem at the holy sites, uh, the stabbings that started after that, and the whole level of violence extended across the uh, uh, region and beyond. Um, so yes, the attention has been diverted. Um, but one thing which I think is fascinating and is an opportunity today is that in the Arab world. Finally, very recently, and this is a new development, you have a new growing realization emerging that, that Arab leadership needs to focus on um, strengthening those um, centers of moderation that still exist to counter the radicalization um, um, of, of, of the population. Um, developing their own capabilities and capacities to deal with threats and actually begin to start taking things in, under their own control. Not to be just the um, subject of outside influence, but to actually be the, 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 the governors of their own fate. This is a new development. I wish it could happen a few years uh, before, because if you look at the situation in um, uh, Mosul and the fall of Mosul, the rise of Daesh, and um, um, and all of that. There was there was uh, there were many in the Arab world who uh, you know thought this was a temporary phenomenon, thought that it was limited just to Iraq or just to Syria, and it wouldn't affect um, affect them. And yet now everyone realizes that that threat was very much a threat to everyone. So that this developing this sort of newfound um, initiative to to strengthen your own ability to defend yourself and to protect yourself, your ability to, to support the centers of moderation uh, versus the centers of radicalism. I think this is a new, new, new phenomenon that is uh, now important, and it, and it also relates to Gaza and to the Palestinian situation. Because if you take that approach and you look at what's happening on the ground, if the PA and President Abbas collapse under the pressure of whatever, the perspective is rather grim that they will be, you know, far more radical and angry people taking over the scene um, than them. So therefore, it's important for Fatah, for the Palestinian leadership to, to strengthen its ability to deliver services, to be, to provide support to its population, and to have a clear political um, um, agenda that is in line with the uh, with the rest of the region. Um, the outside-in approach um, is fantastic. Um, um, and I'm a great supporter of uh, the idea that you need a, uh, a much bigger regional engagement on this file uh, uh, now than, you, than before, uh, comma, if it includes resolving the Palestinian question. If you try to avoid resolving the Palestinian question, you're not going to get uh, uh, much result in this. Because yes, there is a common threat perception between many in the Arab world and uh, many in Israel now of the threats to the region, the radicalization, outside threats, etc. Um, but that, uh, um, that um, uh, common threat assessment cannot materialize in common action unless you also focus on the Palestinian, um, uh, Palestinian file. And of all the issues related to the Palestinian file, Jerusalem is the most emotionally religiously charged issue for, um, uh, for everyone. Um, and, uh, uh, and I think that, that, is, uh, that has always been um, our understanding of the situation. And I don't think there's anything that has changed over the last few uh, months or years to show us that you can actually um, somehow jump over the Palestinians in the Arab-Israeli relationship uh, without actually resolving the, uh, the questions, the question of Palestine. And resolving it again, as the Secretary General, what does he say? No plan B, two-state solution.
Uh, without that, you can't actually uh, uh, do it. Um, last question um, on um, why hasn't it exploded? You know, the Soviet Union lasted for 70 years. And large parts of the Soviet Union lived in poverty and difficulties, and it didn't explode. When you control every aspect of life in Gaza, as Hamas controls every aspect of life in Gaza, of people, it's very difficult to rise up against that, that um, rule and, and, and rebel or, or start an uprising against them. And secondly, on top of that, you have a glass, on top of this glass ceiling, you have a, um, a bulletproof glass ceiling, which is the occupation. So it's very easy for people in Gaza to, to uh, uh, blame everything on Israel, on the occupation, if they feel that it's going wrong. And it's very difficult for them to blame it on Hamas. Because if you're in Gaza and you want to protest um, against uh, the occupation, you're welcome to do so. You can go out into the streets. You can have your protest on a daily basis. If you want to go and protest about <coughs> Um, the rising prices of food, or the lack of work, or um, um, anything that is directly related to those who control the situation, you very f quickly find yourself in a dark spot, mm. probably uh, for some time. Maybe come out with a couple of broken bones after that. Mm. Uh, people see this on a daily basis, and that is, that is what is keeping it um, uh, together. And secondly, on a broader um, aspect of it, it is, you know, people adapt. People adapt to worsening um, uh, situations and worsening environments. Um, that is the way human nature is structured. And yes, I feel myself very, uh, 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 you know, I, I expose myself every month going to the Security Council and saying, oh, it's, it's on the brink of collapsing. This is, it's not sustainable. And yet it's been going on for half a century. Um, a very uh, good colleague of ours, Basim, uh, who is uh, in our Ramallah office, was recruited by Terry Larson um, many years ago in Gaza. And when he was, he used to work for UNRWA, and when he was re recruited by Terry, uh, Terry told him, ah, we're just here for a couple of years, um, so this is not a permanent job. Uh, now it's about 25 years later. Um, so it becomes a permanent uh, feature of the environment. Well, you, you told the Security Council yesterday, or reminded them, that the UN considers all settlement activity to be illegal and an obstacle to peace. You also deplored the firing of rockets from Gaza. In situations like that, where somebody does something that you uh, object to, what recourse do you have? Does the office publish an objection? Do you demand some answer? Um, is any of that effective? In what sense, publish it? Oh, well, I mean, I'm talking about, I mean, do you get in touch with whatever people you can get in touch with in Gaza and say, you must stop uh, the firing of rockets? Uh, oh, yeah, on we, settlement activity, do you, as an office, uh, deplore that and say that must stop? Um, yesterday, what, what, what we presented to the Security Council was a report on uh, Resolution 2334, right. which has a clear structure on what it needs, what we which have to Which is a report, year old, yes, which that is resolution. Exactly a year ago it was adopted. So it includes a section on settlements, a section on violence, uh, etc. So we went through a list of um, uh, developments in each of these areas. Um, but um, uh, yes, it depends on what happens on the ground, because very uh, often we will make, uh, uh, you know, separate statements. Uh, we would, uh, public statements, sometimes not public, depending on what, uh, what happens. Most recently, I think, um, we, had a, uh, we made a, sep one st a, a, a separate statement on um, when a Hamas delegation visited Iran, and they um, came out with a big statement calling for the de destruction of the state of Israel, etc. Now, that's completely unacceptable for anyone to do it. We need to stand out against it. Uh, just as we did um, uh, sometime before that when the Israeli parliament was uh, uh, discussing and adopting a very controversial piece of legislation called the regularization bill, 
which would actually allow the taking of privately owned Palestinian land in the West Bank uh, for, for settlement um, uh, construction. So we also use different, um, you know, sometimes the Secretary General would make a statement, sometimes I would, uh, but we have the monthly report to the Security Council, which uh, means that every one month we have to come here to New York and report to the Security Council what's happening. Do I see any more hands for questions? Yes, Rona, please. And anyone else? Yes. Okay. Um, Got the floor. You have the last word. Yes. Um, my question, it's Rhonda Haubin. Introduce and yourself just for the camera. I'm sorry. Rhonda Haubin, and okay. I have a blog at, D at the TATS website, which is Ditaga Zeitung's website. Uh, my question is, we have the occupier and the occupied, and the occupier doesn't really seem to take any responsibility for the occupied, and yet we're told we need negotiations, but they're two totally unequal situations, and there's obligations of the occupier, and I rarely hear of any activity to ask the occupier to fulfill any of those obligations. Is there some problem with all that? Why is that always left out and we always hear it as if it's an equal situation and which means it can never be solved if that's not taken into account that it's not equal? Thank you. No, it's not an equal um, situation by far. It never was. Um, and there are obligations for uh, Israel under international law, international humanitarian, human rights law that uh, must be upheld. There are, there are uh, uh, responsibilities that Israel needs to fulfill as the occupying power in the um, uh, Palestinian territories. Um, and um, um, the various um, uh, uh, parts of the UN system monitor this um, consistently. Um, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights um, uh, the Office for Humanitarian Affairs. We, they, we publish daily, monthly bulletins uh, uh, with listing very uh, clearly what these obligations are and how they have to be met. But the question of negotiations is that both sides, Israelis and Palestinians, agreed half a century, a quarter of a century ago, to resolve this conflict through negotiations. Um, and we have to preserve that political imperative because if we lose that political imperative, um, we go into um, um, a spiral of violence and um, uh, you know, uh, and and and, and a very, not a, not a very pleasant situation for for either side. But as both sides have have um, agreed to address this through negotiations, one the weaker side, the Palestinian side needs to have its position strengthened. Um, and that is why very often the Palestinians in their uh, reasoning um, rely on international treaties, international uh, resolutions, etc. And what the United Nations and other donors, member states, including the United States does, is to help them build up the institutions that they need for future statehood. Um, uh, but without that perspective of the statehood coming, it becomes very difficult to keep justifying this uh, this momentum, and that means that uh, you know uh, a lot of the achievements that have been uh, uh, achieved over the last uh, quarter of a century uh, are beginning to uh, to, uh, to 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 wither. Um, uh, Gaza is one example. Uh, so we have a lot of efforts in terms of the UN system to help the institution building side uh, of of, of uh, Palestine, particularly because they're the weaker party uh, in any um, uh, negotiation. Nicola, I have just a final very small question. You've mentioned several times that you make monthly reports to the Security Council. Does that mean that you come here from Jerusalem once a month or in the age of Skype and FaceTime, are you able to communicate your reports through uh, media? Well, we, uh, I try to do most of them by video conference from okay. Jerusalem because um, if I had to come to New York, with all due respect to all my friends in New York, uh, <laughs> I think my family will soon leave me. Uh, your family must already be unhappy with you for the places you have to live for your work. Um, thank you so much for coming here and bringing us that eyewitness account. <laughs>